The grace and peace of Christ be with you. Thank you for taking some time to join us for a word given on Sunday, the 29th of September, 2024, at St. James's United Reformed Church in the heart of Newcastle upon Tyne. Our scripture today is from our ongoing series of reading the Gospel of John for 90 days, in which Jesus talks with his disciples. Let us open our ears to the word and wisdom of God from John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11 in the New Revised Standard Version. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And making her stand before all of them, they said to him, Teacher, This woman was caught in the very act of committing adultery. Now in the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They said this to test him so that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And once again, he bent down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they went away, one by one, beginning with the elders. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus straightened up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, sir. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be beautiful in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now this story would make a terrible courtroom drama. There are no cross-examinations, no scandalous unfoldings, nothing that makes such shows gripping. Jesus writes in the sand. We never find out what he was writing. Whilst the religious leaders of the day, the scribes and the Pharisees, bring a woman accused of adultery before him. Whatever happened to the other person she is accused of this act with is never addressed. Jesus asks the religious leaders a question. They never answer, but slowly disappear, leaving the woman there with him. He asks her a question. She never claims innocence. He refuses to condemn her, and she is sent on her way. All the tension is drained out of it. Nobody in Hollywood would back this. Now, it started full of tension. The religious leaders think that they have Jesus caught in a trap, and the woman is a pawn, instrumentalized in their power game. Whenever we read Pharisees and scribes, Think of those super-religious people who try to enforce moral codes and get people to follow them to the letter. In Jesus' time, as perhaps today, they operated out of fear. They were worried that their society, their culture, and their way of life was being destroyed. The Roman Empire had occupied their nation, bringing laws and customs informed not only by paganism, but that elevated the human emperor to the level of a god. They worried that if they did not enforce their religious practice to the letter, God would abandon their people, and they would be forever forgotten by God. So from that perspective, you could try and justify them. They were trying to preserve their people, culture, and the way of life in the face of what must have felt like a globalized, totalizing threat. But whilst they justified their actions on faith, their prime motivator was control of others through fear. Their fear was masquerading as faith. Faith masquerading by fear, a different type of fear than the biblical fear of the Lord, which means respect for God, cannot practice grace. It cannot even imagine grace, forgiveness, generosity of spirit, beauty, or abundance. For people locked in fearfulness, everything becomes a zero-sum game. If you get something, I do not. If I lose something, you get an you get it instead. For the fearful, 
keeping things within the letter of the law was the only way to maintain control of what they considered to be a life and death situation. In this zero-sum world, anyone who disrupted your understanding of how things should be was a threat. Jesus was, is, the great disruptor. In John's Gospel, Jesus' ministry begins first with turning water into wine, but very quickly escalates to Jesus going to Jerusalem, the center of power for these fearful leaders, crafting a whip made of cords, and then chasing money changers and sellers of sacrificial animals out of the temple. Jesus created, created a huge amount of tension between himself and the religious leaders who then spend so much of their time trying to neutralize him. Jesus does not live in fear, not of these petty religious leaders, nor of the power brokers of Rome. Jesus is the embodiment of truth, hope, beauty, and joy. They have come to entrap him, but because they are so full of fear, they cannot see the flaw in their plan. To them, Jesus has two choices both of which represent the poison chalice they think they live within. He is either supposed to agree that the woman should be stoned to death or that the religious law should be broken. But it is even sharper than that. Should he agree that she should be stoned, then he agrees to violate Roman rule, for only Romans could condemn a woman to death. Their thinking is that if he violates Roman law, they can hand him over to the Romans for prosecution. They fail to see the irony. They are seeking freedom from the Romans, but they're relying upon their dominant power to remove the disruption of Jesus. When fear encounters truth, the questions change. Jesus elevates the whole confrontation. He slows down the drama, sets the pace of the confrontation, and then surprises the religious leadership with a simple question that challenges the illusion of control they think they have. Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He cuts right to the heart, making them and us enter a process of self-examination regarding our habits of blame, judgment, condemnation, and punishing. Jesus has said similar things before, such as on the Sermon on the Mount. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me pay, take the speck out of your eye, while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. And that's Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. And the connection is made by uh, Professor David Ford. In their fear, they have become hypocrites. They have failed to see that we are all caught up in sin. And we are. We are all caught up in sin. And for those of us caught up in various forms of sin, we harbor some degree of fearfulness. It locks us up, shuts us down, keeps us from believing that God made us beautiful, able to love and be loved, from seeing the possibilities in this gift of a world and universe that are beyond imagining. There is a rich abundance around us of food, resources, beauty, and imagination. We so often fail to see it. And in our fear of the unknown and the other, we protect what is mine. But Jesus is truth embodied, the truth sitting down in the midst of fear and writing out what are perhaps words of love. We don't know. We fear an encounter with the truth because our sin teaches us that we will come up short because we are caught up in sin. Encountering truth can show us when we are not trying to control other people for our own purposes, the abundance of hope and opportunity around us. This is what happened to the woman. She was not trying to control anyone. She was rendered powerless by the machinations of those petty leaders until she was brought face to face with truth. She never denies her own sin, but she sees new possibilities. Jesus sees beauty in her, and 
he sends her on her way. Is it impossible to go and sin no more? Maybe. But perhaps what is suggested here is not to make the mistake of forgetting that there is always a fullness of possibility beyond what we can imagine when we encounter, and are brave enough to encounter, the truth. We close with a story, a friend and minister, the Reverend Dr. Courtney Stang Tregear in Seattle, likes to share when she believes church people are forgetting the beauty of possibility. On the 10th of July in 2017, in Panama City, Florida, two young boys caught, got caught up in the riptide off the beach, which was pulling them out to sea. Two adults who were boogie on their boogie boards saw them and swam to get them. But with these boys in their arms, they could not get back to shore. One of them made it back on her own, her lungs full of water, calling for help. Other adults and family members then swam out to help, but they, too, got stuck in the riptide. Caught up in fear and urgency, they responded, but alone, it was not enough to help. In fact, it made the situation worse. Mother Nature is indeed powerful, so, mo so much more than even some of those strong swimmers could imagine. Pretty soon, there were nine people caught up in the potentially deadly tide, fearful with good reason. Police were on the beach, waiting for a boat to arrive to rescue the swimmers. Two people, Derek and Jessica Simmons, were also on the beach. And Derek said the first thing that he thought of was another natural phenomenon, ants forming a chain. He grabbed three other beachgoers and started a human chain, arms linked together to reach out into the sea. He recounted, The chain started with a group of around five people. A lot of people were like, There's no way we're getting in the water. We're going to get swept out. But I guess they just swallowed the pride pill and they just got in. Simmons said, of watching the chain of strangers grow. It was pretty amazing stuff for it to be different races, different genders, different ages. Everybody got together to help. Derek and his wife got to the end of the chain and would swim out one by one and hand people to the chain who would pass them back to the shore. They weren't Olympic or even lifeguard trained swimmers, just ordinary people with an idea. The human chain eventually reached 40 people, and they were able to reach the swimmers who were stuck about 65 meters away from shore. Now, did Derek and Jessica Simmons encounter Jesus riding in the sand that day and thus overcome a paucity of imagination to start a human chain? No. But did Jesus leave us with a way to encounter him in daily life? Yes. What was remarkable that day to those who witnessed it was how quickly a group of people worked together to create a solution and put it in action. We encounter the living Lord in every way when we start to work with each other, when we recognize one another, not as those who may potentially take our stuff or our power away, but rather as others endowed with the very thing that makes us universally human, bearers of the image of God. When we swallow our pride pills, as Derek Simmons put it, we can see that image of God. We can see the beauty of people despite sin as God sees us. At the end of his encounter, Jesus straightened up, which we can take to mean that he looked at the woman and asked her if anyone had condemned her. No one, sir. And truth, looking at her face to face, did not condemn her, and neither will it condemn you either. Our lives do not need to be lived as courtroom dramas with people hiding from the light of truth. We know we live with a great deal of tension in trying to not be caught out. But let us have the courage to slow down the dramatic fear, as Jesus did. Let us be unafraid to see one another and be seen. Love and beauty are stronger than hate and sin. And we are all mired in sin. It's hypocrisy to think one person is worse than you. And that can be hard when we imagine hate mongers, for example. 
But truth will always shine out to free us from our paucity of imagination, from our thoughts that we are not beautiful. We can form human chains that rescue people from off the shorelines. We can find ways through the wars raging around us. We can overcome the challenges of human-caused climate change. We can tackle poverty and hunger. We can face the isolation and loneliness that arises from a culture that spews out stuff that makes us feel as if we are not good enough. Why? Because Jesus is still in our midst. Truth is still in our midst. God is with us. The image of God has not been taken from us. We must have the courage to face truth, as that woman did, and let go of the petty, useless levers of control over others that those pitiable religious leaders of Jesus' time were too afraid to let go of. Thanks be to God, we have the church as a way to give that courage. It has been abused as a petty power lever in the past, but that is not its purpose. And we are the church together, praising the living God. Thanks be to God. Amen.